Yeah. Okay, uh, the photo on the right is my great-grandparents, John and Louisa Weatherill, with their foster Indian daughter, Fanny. And I'm going to talk today about the influence that they had and their surroundings on the Navajo Reservation, on Zane Gray's thoughts, on uh, nature especially, and Native Americans. There we go. Um, well, Deborah has uh, first of all, You might talk about that photo on the left real quick, mention that. That's White Stockings, the horse Joe was referring to. Uh, that's right. That's a photo that Zane Gray gave to my great-grandparents, uh, signed uh, with one of his favorite horses, White Stockings. Uh, for years, we wondered where the photo was taken, and it, uh, it was with Todd's help, and Terry was with us when we were out on the Rainbow Bridge Trail, and Sandra that we were able to spot that particular location way out in a very remote area. Uh, oh, I'd also like to recognize uh, Steve Allen and Joel, who are guests here. Steve and I have messed around out in that country, too. Uh, he was with me a couple months ago when we were at this very same spot. Uh, just for a little orientation, uh, we're here in Durango, and I'll be talking about some places in the Four Corners area where the four states of Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Arizona come together. Uh, that's the point right there. Uh, Mancus, Colorado is not too far to the west of us, and the Weatherills uh, lived there before they went out on the Navajo Reservation. I'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, and you'll see just southwest of Mancus is Mesa Verde National Park, the cliff dwellings down there. Uh, further to the west is Monument Valley here, right on the Arizona-Utah border. And not shown on this map, but there's a place right on, just north of the border, uh, called Old Jato, that I'll mention. And then south of there, Kayenta. And that's where Zane Gray came to visit the Weatherills. So we'll be talking about that uh, quite a bit. Uh, northwest of that is Navajo Mountain. Uh, the San Juan River and the Colorado River came to come together and form Glen Canyon. Uh, south of there is Navajo Mountain. And north of Navajo Mountain is Rainbow Bridge. We'll talk about that. And then further to the southwest, is the town of Tuba City down here. Uh, so just to get oriented a little bit, there's the map. Uh, John and Louisa grew up in Mancus, spent their early lives there, uh, got married and had two children, Ben, uh, who's the oldest, the boy, and then Georgia Ida, their daughter, who is generally called sister. 
uh, sister was my grandmother. In, uh, and they, they were in Mancus in the time period about 1880 to 1900. In 1900, they moved onto the reservation and started operating trading posts and lived there for the rest of their life at various places on the reservation. In uh, 1906, they decided to move to the Monument Valley area and although it's quite a popular place today, it was very remote, hard to get to during that time period. Um, so they it seemed like intentionally wanted to go to a, a place where the Indians hadn't been influenced by outsiders. And when they got there, they built this trading post uh, here in the house. Uh, quite a rustic place. Uh, Old Jato, uh, my great grandmother translated as Navajo, a word that means moonlight water. And. Um, they estimated that their nearest white neighbor was 70 miles away, but they very much enjoyed their new neighbors there and got to know them very well and became good friends. Uh, a real different type of people than most of the settlers in this country would have known. These are old photos from their collection. We have boxes and boxes of old photos that the Wetherills left us. Uh, my great grandmother was talking to a Navajo man once and he told her about a huge natural bridge way to the west. So in 1909, John Wetherill was the guide on an expedition that went into that country. It was about a 70 mile horseback ride over some of the most rugged country imaginable. And uh, eventually they came around the corner of a canyon and there they saw a rainbow bridge. And they knew that it was a very special place. In fact, even despite its remoteness and difficulty to access, they recommended that it become a national monument and it was designated as that the next year. Uh, John Wetherill became government custodian Rainbow Bridge National Monument. Uh, the word started getting out to different people, including Zane Gray, who decided he wanted to come and see it. So that was his introduction to this uh, Navajo country of, by Monument Valley. In 1910, the Wetherills decided to move south a ways across the Arizona border, and they established the what's now the town of Kayenta. Uh, this is a photo of their, their trading post in their house in the early days. Down through the years, it became quite a prosperous place. Many people came and visited them, uh, and it was a kind of a launching point if you wanted to visit the rugged country such as Rainbow Bridge or come to learn about the Indians who lived in that area that still practiced their traditional ways of life. I was involved with putting together this book, uh, and it's mainly photographs, uh, most of them from my great-grandparents' collection. So if you're interested in the history of Old Chato or Kanta, uh, this is a good source for that type of information. So it was, Zane Grace came out to Kanta and visited my great-grandparents first in 1913. And then he made four other trips after that, and I have the years here. The uh, written accounts there are from my great-grandparents' guest books, and they're quite interesting records of all the visitors that came, including St. Great, down through the years. On all of these trips, except the 1914 one, he had my great-grandfather take him on the pack trip to Rainbow Bridge. Uh, the 1913 photo, it, this is Louisa Weatherall, my great-grandmother, my grandmother's sister. Uh, this is Emma Schwartz, part of Zane Gray's entourage, and Lillian Wilhelm, the artist who is Dolly's cousin. I'll mention her a little bit later again. Well, there are a lot of 
of stories we could tell about all of this, but our time's limited. So I decided on this talk to focus on the 1922 trip, which was really uh, a way for Zane Gray to get material for the Vanishing American that he had been planning on writing. He asked my great-grandfather to take him on a trail to the Rainbow Bridge that had never been uh, traversed by white men, I guess other than John Wetherill. Uh, so John uh, said he'd take him on what he called the old Paiute Trail. And um, instead of the route that the 1909 Discovery Expedition took, which came way up here and around, or the one that Zane Gray took, 1913, which came down through Segi Canyon and up. He went on this other trail through some real rugged country. Uh, Steve and I were out there the last year and stood right on the edge of Paiute Mesa and looked down on that trail. And it is some pretty wild country. <laughs> we're thinking of maybe hiking it one of these days. But um, Zane Gray was quite impressed. And uh, not only with getting to Rainbow Bridge, but with some of the scenery along the way. Here are some photos of some sp very special spots on the trail. Monument Valley. I think this next one was taken on the rim of Paiute Canyon, but I haven't positively identified it. But this one I have, it's where the trail tops out after crossing Paiute. And Dan, you're asking me about the upper crossing and the lower crossing of Paiute Canyon. Uh, this is Paiute Canyon here, and this was called the lower crossing. In other words, it's further downstream. If they had come up through Sagi Canyon, uh, they would have crossed down in here, and that was the upper crossing. So a lot of wild country, always something new to see, and Zane Gray was quite thrilled about it. Uh, beyond that point was uh, a very special place that Zane Gray called the Glass Mountains. And some of us have been there. I've had the pleasure of being there with Terry, Todd, Scott, Kevin, Sandra, Gus, and Steve also. And Zane Gray thought a lot about it, too. Uh, he, uh, he made special note of the Glass Mountains. Uh, a very precarious spot to take horses. Mm -hmm. And then the new Surprise Valley, the original Writers of Purple Sage Surprise Valley was located down Segi Canyon, but I think when Zane Gray saw this area in 1913, he believed that it fit the description that he had in his mind a lot better. And so from then on, this is what he called Surprise Valley. And it's a very special place as well. Zane Gray wrote three non-fictional articles about this trip uh, down into the desert that Joe quoted earlier. Trails over the Glass Mountains and Surprise Valley. And those are very interesting if you want to know more about the geography of that region. But of course, his real reason for going out there was to gather information for this uh, project, which was the not fictional account, The Vanishing American, uh, that made its debut in November of 1922 in the Ladies Home Journal. Uh, if you know the geography and the history of that area, you'll find that there's very much in the story that's actually literal. Uh, he could have copied things directly from his field notes about the geography, for instance. This spot, topping out of Paiute Canyon, uh, very clearly in the story is where the eastern girl, Marion, who was coming out to be reunited with the Navajo, er, the Indian man, Nafai, uh, where they were reunited. Uh, when she got to the trading post, 
she learned that the Indian was out herding sheep, and so the trader Withers took her on a pack ride over some very rough country, which was obviously the country that Zane Gray had been over on his trip to Rainbow Bridge. And so this spot was where Nofai was standing up on top of the rim as Marion climbed up the, the steep trail. Uh, some of the other places in the, the fictional account were real places too. Sometimes literary critics like to read all kinds of symbolism into things, but in reality, much of this story was based on things that really happened. So the location Mesa in the book was Tuba City, where there was an Indian agency and boarding school. Uh, and of course, Kaidam, the trading post, was my great-grandparents' trading post. It's interesting how he described Kaidab in the, in the story versus the reality of what was there. Very accurate. Huge bags of burlap containing wool were being packed into a wagon by Indian freighters. This is a photo of the trading post that Zane Gray took with the bags of, of wool. He said, Marion followed Mrs. Weathers into the Mr. Weathers into the yard beside the trading post where somewhat in the background stood a low squat, picturesque stone house with a roof of red earth. That's really what was there. Inside the house, blankets on the floor and couch, baskets on mantel and wall, and a strange painted frieze of Indian <coughs> figures, crude and elemental, striking. These left the room with its atmosphere. A bright fire blazed in the open stone fireplace. Books and comforts were not lacking. Uh, that's the Wetherill House. This room opened into a long dining room with the same ornamental Indian effects. And from it ran a hallway remarkable for its length and variety of colors and its decorations. A lot of the characters in the book uh, were based on real people as well. And Henry He's the expert on this. Uh, he can tell you a lot more than I'm going to cover. But uh, just to touch on a few of them, the villains of the story were an Indian agent named Blucher and a missionary named Morgan. And they were based on real people. Uh, Blucher was based on a man, an Indian agent named Walter Runke, a uh, very controversial figure. Morgan, the missionary, was based on a man named John Butler. Uh, the bottom image is a letter that a Navajo man <coughs> wrote to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs uh, objecting to the presence of John Butler on the reservation. Also, some of the good guys in the book were based on real people. Uh, there was another missionary, Rams Ramsdale, in the book, that was based on a man named Shine Smith. Uh, the Waltersons in the book were based on Lillian and Westbrook Robertson. And Lillian, by the way, was Lillian Wilhelm, the artist, uh, Zane Gray's uh, wife's cousin, who had, had married Mr. Robertson and then later got divorced. And of course, John and Louisa Wetherill were, be, were the inspiration for the traders in the novel, The Withers. Uh, Zane Gray's descriptions in the book of the wit, Mr. and Mrs. Withers, were very true to life as well and uh, indicate his respect for them. Withers was a good man, a trader who helped the Indians and did not make his post a means to cheat them. Mrs. Wetherill. Mrs. Withers was more to the Indians than any other white person had ever been. Uh, Mrs. Withers was no ordinary woman. Marion sensed something of the power she had felt in women of high position as they met their guests. Only in the case of Mrs. Withers, it was simplicity of power, a strange unconscious dignity, spiritual rather than material. 
Her voice had a, some strange low liquid quality utterly new to Marion. Uh, people who really knew my great grandmother wrote the same type of things about her. And uh, I think my, uh, Joe talked about the, uh, my great grandmother talking to Zane Gray about the Indians. In the novel, he said he has Mrs. Withers saying, Indians are not what they appear to most white people. They're children of nature. They have noble hearts and beautiful minds. The Vanishing American movie came out in 1925, and uh, you'll notice here that the technical advisor was Louisa Wetherill. I believe she uh, told them about the costumes that would be authentic and also helped recruit some of the uh, Native American actors in the movie. This boy on the, on the bottom, Nasja, is uh, he was kind of a star of the show. He didn't speak English, but he was uh, just a natural born actor. And if you watch the movie, we'll be showing, I think, tomorrow night, you'll, I think you'll be impressed by him. And uh, I wouldn't doubt that she recommended him for that position. Uh, Steve and I hike, by the way, with his son, Leo Mannheimer. And I think they look quite, quite a bit alike, don't they, Steve? And then uh, my great-grandfather, John Wetherill, he loved the wild country out there. He was more at home out in the canyons than he was in his own house and would never have wanted to move back to a city. Uh, so he was quoted as saying, the desert is home. In the book, Zane Gray has the trader saying, places have more to do with happiness than people. And uh, he kind of carried this over to the Indian protagonist in the story. The why he said, people are false, human nature is imperfect, places are true. So Jane Gray was toying with the idea of how do humans relate to nature in this book, uh, which turns out to be quite an interesting uh, intellectual exercise. Marion is quoted as saying, if the red man was inherently noble, then the white man was a step above the Indian in an evolution, past the stage of barbarism, steeped in a material progress of the world. So I think Zane Gray is trying to reconcile in his own mind this radically different lifestyle he was seeing among the Native Americans and the one that he was brought up with back east. Uh, and so I think it's instructive to try and delve into this question a little bit more and understand what he was saying here. Uh, to do that, we really need to know what he meant by evolution, barbarism, and the material progress of the world. And to maybe explore that a little more, I want to go back in the history of the Wetherills just a bit. Uh, this is the entire family, a big family that uh, had a ranch in Mancus, Colorado, not too far from here. John's father was B.K. Wetherill and mother Marion. They were Quakers from back east, uh, B.K. from Pennsylvania, and John uh, and Marion from New York. Uh, they worked their way west and eventually moved, ended up in the Mancus area around 1880. Uh, John had a sister, Anna, who married a man named Charles Mason. And then this is a picture of the, the five Wetherill brothers, John here, his oldest brother Richard, then Al, and younger brothers Clayton and Winslow. Uh, so sometimes you hear about the Wetherills, it's a complicated family when you consider all the different players. But uh, anyway, that's the family that lived in Mancus uh, by the turn of the century, 1900. They, uh, BK was, had died, and the rest of the family had kind of started to move along. Uh, this is a ranch that they had in Mancus, out, just outside of Mancus, the Alamo Ranch. Uh, it was quite a prosperous place, and it 
next day, but the family encountered some financial difficulties and ended up losing the ranch. Uh, eventually, uh, I mean, significantly in the background is Mesa Verde uh, that was close to Weatherill's, and they started herding cattle down Mancus Canyon, which got very close to, to Mesa Verde. One of the stories you'll read if you read about the Weatherill's is a winter day in 1888 when Richard and Charlie Mason were looking for stray cattle on top of Mesa Verde and looked across a canyon and saw this huge cliff dwelling down below. And it, it was what they later named Cliff Palace in what's now Mesa Verde National Park. Charlie Mason wrote, it appeared as though the inhabitants had left everything they had possessed right where they had used it last. So you can imagine the thrill of coming across a place like that. And then uh, subsequent days, months, they found many more cliff dwellings that had been untouched since the original inhabitants had left them. Uh, this created a problem, though, because other people started coming in and tearing things up, and the Weatherills knew this was important um, architecture and, and artifacts that needed to be preserved. So my great-great-grandfather wrote a letter to the Smithsonian Institution uh, pleading for their help in preserving uh, these ancient things. <coughs> the Smithsonian didn't think they could do anything to help, so they forwarded the letter to the Bureau of Ethnology, which was in Washington, D.C. And the director of the Bureau of Ethnology was the famous Colorado River explorer, John Wesley Powell. So he received like, uh, B.K. Wetherill's letter and passed it on to one of his subordinates, his archaeologist, William Henry Holmes. Holmes wrote a very disappointing reply to B.K. Wetherill. Of course, it's a pity that they should not be reserved and preserved, but when their multitude is considered, it seems a Herculean task. And uh, my great-great-grandfather wrote several other letters that went unanswered. Uh, well, that's a whole story in itself, but what I want to explore right now is why would a government agency, Bureau of Ethnology, not be interested in preserving something that's significant? So I delved into that question quite a bit, and I came up with some very <coughs> uh, answers. It turns out that John Wesley Powell was a, a student of this man, Lewis Henry Morgan, who had written a book called Ancient Society, Researches into the Lines of Human Progress from Savagery through Barbarism <coughs> to Civilization. So, Zane Gray talks about evolution and progress is, he's talking, there's the word progress, about humans bettering themselves and becoming civilized. Well, you can immediately see what that meant about their attitude towards the Indians. And so uh, there are actually accounts where people have written about the cliff dwellings and um, ancient artifacts of the United States wondered why anybody would even want to think about them because all they were were reflections of how our ancestors were thousands of years ago and there's no value in studying them or preserving them uh, and that somehow the Indians were stuck in the past and unable to accept civilization's benefits. But that was the mentality that was going on John Wesley Powell himself wrote two articles, one of them from savagery to barbarism, and the second from barbarism to civilization. And so these articles explain how he accepted these same views. Uh, there is a very interesting statement he made in one of them that I found very helpful in understanding all of this. He said it's not by adaptation to environment by the creation of an artificial environment. So he's 
dismissing the practices of the Native Americans, which is to stay close to nature and learn to adapt to it, which involves backcountry skills, for one thing, and also, I think, some psychological changes where we uh, try and come to appreciate things in nature that maybe at, at first we're afraid of. But anyway, John Wesley Powell was asserting that that's the way of the past. People of today uh, should be praised for their ability to create artificial environments. So these are the two philosophies of life, I think, that Zane Gray was dealing with in the Vanishing American. Uh, he had seen the Navajos in, around the Weatherall's place who were still practicing adaptation to nature, staying close to nature. He himself had a background in the East, that was very artificial in its surroundings, and he was trying to answer the question, which of these is better, or can you go from one to the other? I've created this little drawing to kind of illustrate maybe this a little more. Uh, so inside the, the building is the artificial environment that most people in this country uh, now accept as being the comfortable place to be. Outside is the natural environment that the Indians lived in, and uh, they didn't seem to have any desire to accept the white man's view that it's better to come inside than to stay outside. So uh, kind of a corollary to this is the people on the inside didn't seem to want to uh, accept people staying on the outside. Somehow that was unacceptable for there to be Native Americans still living uh, close to nature. We had to try and get them to come inside. For, and I'm not sure what the reason was, but uh, maybe it was an insecurity in their own position. But anyway, uh, we need to civilize these barbarians, was the message. So that's the background between, behind the boarding schools that the government set up. And this was a policy that went on for maybe 80 years uh, to forcibly uh, get Indians to go to school indoctrinate them into white man's ways, and hopefully they won't go back to their old ways of thinking. The photos on the bottom are a Navajo man, a uh, young man named Tom Trolino, who was sent to school back in Pennsylvania, a before and after shot of him. Uh, and the question is, was he better off after or not? William Henry Holmes, the man who replied to my great-great-grandfather's letter, uh, wrote an article on this subject. And he actually sh drew this little uh, figure, which shows the evolutionary ladder going up. Uh, the, the lines on it are different uh, North American cultures that have somehow become different from each other, but he believed that they would all come together eventually and become one master race that all believe the same thing. Uh, the, uh, the little black spot here was uh, the Indians such as the Navajos who wouldn't accept white man's ways and he believed they would die out uh, because they couldn't integrate themselves with the thinking of the rest of us. So that's William Henry Holmes's vision of the vanishing American himself. But uh, there was a sinister aspect of what he was talking about. He said, the complete absorption or blotting out of the red race will be quickly accomplished if peaceful amalgamation fails. Extinction of the weaker by less gentle means will do the work. And this was actually after the turn of the century when the Indians weren't a big threat as far as warfare or anything like that, but somehow the 
thinking was it's unacceptable for people to stay uh, close to nature, uh, what John Wesley Powell would say, practicing adaptation to nature. These are some of the intellectual questions that Zangri was talking about. Look, as far as the other side of the coin, adaptation to nature, I learned a lot about that by reading this manuscript that was in my great-grandmother's papers. Uh, it was an oral history of a Navajo man that she knew named Wolf Killer. And it starts out, when I was a young boy, about six years old, my grandfather and my mother started me on the path of light. Uh, one day the wind was blowing very hard. My mother told me to take the sheep out just the same. My brother and I were very angry because we had to leave the Hogan fire. Well, the boys were complaining to themselves and they didn't realize that their grandfather was listening in. So he came up to him and gently started talking to him. He said, do not worry about the wind blowing. We cannot help it and there's some reason for it. And he gave him a lot of lessons, not only in how nature is not that bad or dangerous, if you know how to deal with it, but you can really learn to appreciate it and um, start looking at the little things around you, nature, and learning a lot about life and actually becoming a lot wiser. Uh, actually, lessons that you couldn't learn in the artificial environment. So Wolf Keller finally concluded we thought the wind was just a useless thing to cause us unhappiness, but now we saw that it had many purposes cleared the air of the odors of decaying plants and dead animals, brought the clouds on its wings to give us rain and made us strong. And there were many other lessons that the grandfather gave the children. Uh, so this is what I consider uh, a significant part of adaptation to nature. It's we can deal with our own thinking and feelings and become uh, not only content be out in nature, but uh, to really appreciate what it has to offer, rather than trying to avoid nature by fleeing to these artificial environments. So that's the other philosophy of life. Uh, the grandfather concluded all things are beautiful and full of interest if you observe them closely and study them. Wolf Keller was concerned that these lessons were being lost generations. So he asked my great-grandmother to write down his stories, translate them, write down. And uh, we were fortunate after many decades to finally get the stories published in this book. So the Indians, the Navajos, that the Wurrels <coughs> interacted with uh, they found to be very fascinating people, um, in some cases very wise people, uh, and probably more interesting than some of the people they would have encountered in the cities. These are just a few photos from their collection. Well, Zane Gray I think picked up on some of this. Uh, and so in the book, he talks about no fight when he was a young boy, saying he was unconsciously and unutterably happy because he was in perfect harmony with the reality and spirit of nature that encompassed him. Uh, and I think it was pretty remarkable and unique for Zane Gray to start sending this message out that there's natural world out there that's very gratifying to get to know and that there are people out there who recognize that and live in a way that they can learn from nature. So getting back to our little sketch, really what I think the essence of the book is, is this threshold right here. Is it possible to cross it? Uh, not just as a visitor, but permanently. As far as Nofai, the Navajo boy who was captured and sent back east to school, he 
he came back to the reservation. So he was brought inside the room. Could he go back out and resume his old practice of relating to nature the way he used to? Uh, as far as Marion, the, the New York, uh, the East Coast girl, could she leave inside the room and go out and adapt, uh, adopt the beliefs of the people who had lived out there uh, all their lives. I found Zane Gray's uh, final interpretation of this a little bit disappointing. In this article that came out in 1924, he said, is, is not conscious, conscience the difference between the savage and civilized man, the great factor in human progress. So, really implying here that civilized people are morally superior to non-civilized people. Uh, so in that respect, I don't think the Weatherills would have agreed with that, and I don't think he quite picked up on all they were trying to teach him. But as far as Marion, was she able to uh, go out and live like the Native Americans. Uh, this quote shows that she, that Zane Gray recognized the same uh, dichotomy <coughs> that, that John Wesley Powell was talking about. And you were sick of the artificial life of the modern customs, well that, indeed I was. Uh, and you really have a longing to go back to simple and outdoor ways. Marion says, I think under my fair skin, I'm a savage. But uh, in the book, she definitely didn't end up living like one. So I think Zane Gray's conclusion was you can't really go from civilization out to uh, intimate contact with nature and stay out in that state. Uh, it's very interesting when the book came out in 1925, he added an entire chapter, which is Marion thinking about all these issues. And this statement pretty much sums up what I just said, that uh, the elements worked on the minds of white people. Mostly they hated the wild country. Thus, deterioration was sure. They went back on the scale of progress. So I think Zane Gray was struggling with these concepts. He, he himself found deep he found himself deeply gratified by being out in the, the country of the Wetherills, uh, but he didn't want to give up some of the comforts of the East. So this is where he ended up. But very interestingly, in the same chapter that he added, he put this statement, but few men and those lovers of the open and who welcome the hard life grow ever nobler for contact with the desert. That some men and women do grow through a strange evolution right by de desert life is proof of the divinity that is within them. These are closest to the Indians. And I have to wonder if you might have been talking about the Weathers. We do. If there's questions for Harvey, let's let's take a couple of questions here. Yeah, I uh, I couldn't help but think. Uh, you know that Henry Nardi was showing me a, a passage just before we began this of uh, Gray essentially uh, handwriting a line that was uh, pontificating the the Christian viewpoint in ways that weren't natural to me and reading uh, four years of reading great all the time. And it seems to me that uh, some of these observations that you've been sharing with us are showing the almost desperate uh, dance that Gray was doing those two years, trying to salvage, on one hand, his relationship with, with publishers like Harper's, and trying to uh, 
come to some sort of uh, meeting of the minds with the with certain elements like the ministers who were not happy with him. And consequently, I'm sure that line, Henry, that we were talking about uh, was probably written under pressure. And so some of these uh, stretches of the imagination in terms of Gray's phraseology here, I think, uh, are part and parcel with this turmoil that was going on during these, these several years between the publishing of the magazine serialization and the final book. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, but I think also we might want to consider that Zane Gray's uh, thinking also changed a little bit between the time the magazine articles came out and the book, and he was trying to pin it down. But you're right, that's a good point. missionaries that you approved of. His last name was Smith. And were these missionaries Mormon missionaries? No, they were Presbyterians. I see. Uh, the one that um, he considered corrupt uh, was accused of doing things like uh, taking water supplies like a spring using it to grow his own crops and blocking the Indians and taking uh, There's also a story Henry can tell you about in the book yeah, the Navajo there's a, a part of the book is an account of a, a Navajo man who was murdered because he wouldn't send his he wouldn't send his daughter to the mission uh, training and that really happened uh, it might have been that he wouldn't send her to school but that, that was a real occurrence They still have the boarding schools. Uh, when I was out there 30 years ago and traveled out there, uh, they still had them. Yeah, they still do. Uh, it's not quite the same philosophy anymore that it used to be, but there's still Navajo kids who are in such remote areas they can't really ride buses to school. But um, the attitude back in those days, and this went on until 1933, was you civilize these people. And they, they even would go to the extent of not allowing them to go back to their parents because they didn't want them to revert back to their old way of thinking. That's all gone by the wayside. I had, I'm a medical physicist, I had a contract to go to all these little schools that had x-ray units that were, you know, the kids would fall down, they wouldn't know whether they'd break their arm or something. So they had these x-ray units. And I went out there and calibrated them in all these little schools out there. The kid who really had a broken arm, they had to send him to Tuba City and uh, places like that. And this in 79. Yeah. They, um, another thing they did was they wouldn't let him speak to him. Right. What did Louisa think of The Vanishing American? Do you have any account of that? No, we never heard. Zane Gray said it was a, uh, an Indian name that meant warrior. And someday I'm going to ask a Navajo if, if it's a meaningful word in their language. Uh, obviously, he was talking about Navajos, although he didn't even use that term. But um, he might have made it up. R repeat that question. Repeat the question. Oh, the question was uh, the word Nofai.
is Wolf, Wolf Killer. If you guys see this any place in the stores, buy it. It's a great book, and it does give you insight into the vanishing America. And you might really want to show that, but uh, this is what I like to say. Yeah, on, on, on the missionaries, uh, John Butler, uh, I, I happen to have been in uh, 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 Albuquerque last January, and, and there is a Presbyterian uh, 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 fund, uh, school there, a library, and John Butler was a real person. And indeed, uh, I, uh, there was a Presbyterian who wrote his thesis about uh, the Presbyterians in, in uh, the Navajo Reservation. And he does indicate, he gives a letter of John Butler wrote when he was 82 years old, reflecting on the past. But John Butler did get himself into a lot of trouble. But you have to remember the times. You have to remember that these missionaries were going out there with their families. He had three children, a wife, and he was earning less than $100 a month to live on. And so you can see how the temptations would go, would get in there. But uh, not only was he castigated by Zane Gray in the fictional character, but the governor of New Mexico and the commissioner of Indian Affairs, both, and you see in my little article, they both requested that John Butler be uh, removed from the reservation. And they wrote to the Presbyterian Mission Board in New York City, and I have a copy of that letter requesting him to be transferred. And then I tried to contact the, the uh, Presbyterian archives and everything, and I never found an answer to it. But my, my guess is that there never was a formal answer, but that indeed John Butler did get transferred. But in answer to Alan, Alan's question, there were other missionaries there too. Uh, in, addition to, in, in addition to that mission, uh, uh, John Butler, there was a man named Fry, who in the book is called Friel. He was a Mennonite missionary, but he was a little bit south in the in the Hopi that the goes. And, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, uh, in both 1916 and 1922, I found uh, investigation reports by the Bureau of Indian Affairs at that time criticizing both of these missionaries for their activities. And so, so there were the, I mean, they're in the, they're in the National Archives file of Washington, D.C. Well, I, I think they were trying to survive. You have to remember that, you know, at other times, you, you, you can't be, and, and I don't have a, a formal opinion at all yet, but I think you have to remember the times coming out a uh, hundred years ago out west and to try to settle with a family and children and try to survive. And, and, and of course, you know, the government policy was to civilize the by taking them out of their environment. So the two things sort of work together. And uh, uh, so you have to remember the times. But uh, uh, there was also the indication in the book, and you see it in, in the, I think, chapter 11 that, that Harvey mentioned. That chapter actually was written for the Ladies Home Journal, but they cut it out because as, uh, as Joe mentioned, the, the editor, Curry, he wanted to tone down the criticism. So they cut out the criticism of missionaries, and that chapter 11 has a lot of that criticism.